The next speaker is Peter Glick, who received his uh, PhD at Berkeley and at, was what the, I believe, the first person to look at the effects of predicted climate change on the hydrological system. He's continued to have a long career uh, looking at many issues related to water and climate and the environment. He's the author of 12 books on this subject. He's uh, most recently been working on compiling an archive of the history of conflicts that have occurred that are related to water and water distribution. A few accolades about Peter. He uh, co-founded the Pacific Institute in 1987 and served as, as its director until recently and still serves as its director emeritus. In 2003, he received a MacArthur Fellowship. In 2006, he was inducted into the US National Academy of Sciences. And in 2011, he and the Institute received the first US water prize. So please uh, join me in welcoming Peter Glick. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be here this morning. Uh, I'd like to add my thanks to the organizers, to, to Jack, uh, to Peter Raven, especially who I've known for a long, long time. And as many of the previous speakers have, have said, um, I'll go anywhere Peter wants me to go. Uh, also, thank you, Colin, for, for introducing the Mississippi Basin and reminding us how important rivers are for us. Um, what I was asked to do is to talk about the future of water. And what I'd really like to do is two things. I'd like to talk about the nature of our global water challenges today. Uh, but then I'd also like to talk about uh, a positive vision for the future. Uh, like some of the previous speakers, I'm I'd like to think of myself as an optimist. Uh, it's increasingly difficult in certain places and in certain times, but uh, what I'd like to do at the end is present an optimistic vision for where I believe we could be uh, in terms of fresh water resources. So let me start. I'm going to talk about the future of water, but it's hard not to talk about the past to begin with. And Peter Raven yesterday in a tour de force 15 minutes gave a 200,000 year history of humanity, <laughs> for those of you who were here and remember that. Um, and I like to talk about the three ages of water, and the first age goes back 200,000 years. The, the first age of water was when prehistoric humans existed, and we took water where we found it, and we dumped our wastes where we were, and it didn't really matter. Uh, because there weren't very many of us. Peter gave the population dynamics, and you know there were a million of us around the world. I mean, that's sort of hard to conceive of these days. But, but the first age of water, we took water where we found it, and we dumped our wastes back into those streams, and that was the reality. And it didn't matter in part because life was pretty miserable and brutish and short anyway, and population densities were low, and we were a hunter-gatherer society. And that age lasted for hundreds of thousands of years. The second age really began 11,000 years ago or so when we started growing in population and when humans invented agriculture and started settling down. And the second age started in the ancient uh, centers of humanity the, the in ancient Mesopotamia between the Tigris and the Euphrates River and in the Indus Valley in southern Asia. Um, this is a, a graph that shows uh, the Tigris and the Euphrates uh, where the first civilizations really developed, three, four, 5,000 BC. Um, and it started to grow as populations grew and as we demanded more and more water resources. Uh, the second age was characterized by development of engineering and infrastructure and our cities grew uh, and agricultural demands grew and we learned more and more about science and technology. And as our cities grew, uh, we figured out how to move water from farther and farther away because our cities outgrew our local water supplies. And we built aqueducts and we built uh, uh, delivery systems and we built started to build water treatment systems, and that was the beginning of the, the second age of water. 
And we really saw it in the 1800s when our cities got really big. Uh, this is an ancient map, of the, an old map of the city of Cologne. And in the 1820s, uh, the poet Coleridge went and visited the city of Cologne. And he wrote a poem that said in part, the river Rhine, it is well known, doth wash the city of Cologne. But tell me, nymphs, what powers divine shall henceforth wash the city, Rhine, the, the river Rhine? The idea was we were dumping our wastes in the cities and in, from the cities into the rivers, and the rivers were becoming more and more contaminated, and that led to bad things. Uh, it led to water-related diseases like cholera and dysentery and typhoid and guinea worm and schistosomiasis, the, the things that we get when we don't have safe, reliable access to water. Uh, there's a, a little cartoon in the bottom here. It says, you can't see it in the back perhaps, but death's dispensary. Uh, the realization by around 1850 that contaminated water, as opposed to perhaps contaminated air, was what was responsible for the waves of cholera that swept over Europe and North America and Russia and killed tens of thousands of people at a time. And as we learned more and more about medicine and science, uh, as we learned more and more about the causes of water-related diseases, we started in this second age of water to develop the technologies to deal with this, to treat water supply, to figure out how to manage human wastes. Um, and that led to the flowering, really, of the chemistry and the biology and the engineering and the technology that produced modern water systems that the truth is all of us grew up with and all of us depend upon. And one of the consequences of the second age of water and the development of modern water systems was we addressed water-related diseases. And in the United States, for example, the first water infrastructure to chlorinate and filter water and deliver treated water was put in place around 1908, 1909, 1910 in, in uh, New Jersey and in Philadelphia and in New York and in St. Louis. We started to treat our water systems and cholera and dysentery and water-related diseases in the richer countries of the world where we built these modern second age water systems disappeared. And we don't have cholera and typhoid and dysentery in the United States now because we built a modern water system. And that reflects the nature of the second age of water when we sort of figured out how to deal with that critical piece of the puzzle. But we have not solved all of our water problems. Uh, this is a picture from 1952 of the Cuyahoga River on fire in Ohio. Uh, in 1969, the Cuyahoga River burned again. It burned sort of regularly. And of course, it wasn't the river that was burning. It was the industrial wastes that we were dumping in the river. But in 1969, it burned on national television. Um, and that made a big difference. And the 60s were a time of growing environmental awareness. Uh, the 1969 was also the year there was a huge oil spill off Santa Barbara in California, and these kinds of environmental challenges became well known, and they became a concern, and they led to things like the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Clean Water Act, the foundational laws that protect water quality in the United States. And despite the fact that the Second Age led to an incredible awareness and understanding about how to deal with water challenges from a chemical, technological, engineering, economic perspective, we have not solved all of our water problems. Today, the UN estimates, estimates that seven to 800 million people worldwide don't have access to the kinds of water systems and safe water that you and I take for granted and 2.3 billion people, 30 or 40 percent of the world's population today, don't have access to safe and adequate sanitation systems. Uh, and that leads to water-related diseases in much of the rest of the world, and approximately 2 million preventable but not prevented deaths from water-related diseases even today. So the second age of water, that great flowering of understanding and science and technology, hasn't reached all of the world's population. And that's part of the global water challenge today. And 
sometimes even in the United States, rivers catch on fire. And again, it's not rivers in this case. Uh, this is the James River in Virginia. This was an oil train carrying fracked oil uh, that, that was running alongside the river. There was a train accident, the oil spilled, the river caught fire. Uh, we still have these problems with water quality uh, around the world and even in the United States. And some of the problems that we solved, uh, like the problems with Lake Erie, uh, with the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Clean Water Act in the 60s and the 70s, are coming back. Uh, we heard a little bit about the Mississippi River, but one of the challenges in the Mississippi River and in the Mississippi Basin, and frankly in rivers that run through agricultural areas in general, is nutrients. Uh, we overuse pesticides, we overuse fertilizers and nitrates and phosphates pour into our rivers and pour into our lakes. Uh, this was an algal bloom in Lake Erie that shut down the water supply of the city of Toledo, Ohio for three days because the city water system was not meant, was not designed, was not built to deal with toxic algae uh, and we're now seeing again because of nutrients and I would note higher temperatures and I'll talk about climate change a little bit in a little bit later, uh, uh, led to toxic algal blooms that the city was not able to deal with. And that is a challenge for us. And of course, Flint, Michigan. We have an incredible water system in the United States and in much of Western Europe, uh, a modern water system that delivers incredibly high quality potable water to us at incredibly low cost, and yet we're not maintaining that infrastructure. We're not investing in that infrastructure the way we need to in order to prevent problems like Flint, Michigan, where changes in the water source led to a change in the water composition, which led to uh, uh, corrosion in the old water pipes from some of the mainline industrial cities that we've built around the world and around the United States. Uh, and this is still a problem. I mean, it's inconceivable to me that that four or five years on, we have not still fully addressed the problem of providing safe, affordable water for the entire population of the planet, much less uh, a modern industrial city like Flint in a rich country like the United States. And in California, where I live, we have populations in the Central Valley of California, an agricultural region that don't have uh, access to adequate, safe groundwater because the water is contaminated with nitrates. So again, even in the United States, uh, we have problems meeting basic needs for safe water. Part of the water problem worldwide is ecological. All of the water that humans use comes out of the natural ecosystem that also depends on that, on that water. Uh, and so we, we heard about the Mississippi River as sort of one of the most used rivers in the world. The Colorado River is completely consumed no water reaches the mouth of the Colorado anymore. The Colorado shared by seven states in the United States and Mexico. Uh, all of the uh, uh, endemic species of fish in the Colorado, many of them are endangered or threatened with extinction. Uh, this is the Salton Sea in California. The Yangtze River and the Yellow River have ecological problems. The Yellow River also doesn't reach its, its delta anymore because it's completely consumed during parts of the year. Uh, wetlands are drying up, water quality, contamination, uh, there are all sorts of ecological problems and I'm sure many of you can think for all of your local rivers or streams about ecological problems associated with the way humans use water and that's part of our global challenge as well. And climate change. Uh, I'm a climate scientist in part by training. I, I'm not going to give you this, the climate story that you've heard about all day yesterday and, and earlier today, uh, except to say a, a few things about the connection between water and climate. The hydrologic cycle that you all remember from second grade, uh, evaporation, the formation of clouds, condensation, precipitation, runoff, back to the oceans, evaporation again, the hydrologic cycle is the climate cycle. And as we change the climate, we will and are fundamentally changing the hydrologic cycle. And uh, that's not a prediction, it's an observation. Uh, we already know the climate's changing. We already know that humans are responsible. As you heard yesterday, there's no debate in the scientific community about that. Uh, and 
as we change the climate cycle, we will change every aspect of the hydrologic cycle. And just as one example, uh, we've heard a lot of talk yesterday about extreme events. That's one of the big pieces of this, of this challenge. Uh, we worry about extreme events. Colin talked about droughts and floods. Those are hydrologic extremes. We have them naturally, but as the climate changes, we worry and are beginning to see changes in extreme events influenced by climate change. Higher temperatures, more evaporation, impacts on droughts, more demand for water, changes in precipitation patterns, changes in storm frequency and intensity. Again, you've heard a lot of this already, and I don't want to belabor it, except to point out that these aren't predictions, these are observations increasingly. This is a quote, the evidence that humans are changing the water cycle of the United States is increasingly compelling. And that was written 17 years ago, 18 years ago. This is, this is I don't want to say old news, but it's not new news. We know that these are the challenges that we face from climate change. And every aspect of the problems that I've described, ecological stress, uh, water availability, water quality, all of those things will also be affected by the climate changes that are here coming, here and coming. Um, finally, on the sort of bad news side of things, uh, I do a lot of work on conflicts over water, uh, looking at water used as a weapon, water as a target or a casualty of conflicts that start for other reasons, water as a trigger of conflict. We maintain a database going back 4,500 years to Ironically enough, ancient Mesopotamia um, in between the Tigris and the Euphrates. Uh, this is just a graph that shows from 1930 to 2016 the number of conflicts we've recorded in that database over water resources. And it's growing. And it's growing because populations are growing and the demand for water is growing and competition for water is growing. Uh, it's growing because there are conflicts in general that are unrelated to water but where water systems are attacked. Uh, and increasingly in the last few years, we've seen that in Syria, we've seen it in Yemen, where civilian systems are attacked, water systems are attacked. That's a violation of international law, I won't go into it, uh, but it's an unfortunate reality of the connection between conflict and resources generally. So, that's the bad news. That's the second era of water. It, it, it has advantages. We've solved many of our water problems. We've failed to solve other water problems. Um, I would like to argue that uh, there's a positive future out there, um, but it's going to require a new way of thinking about water. And I'd like to describe that for the last little piece of my talk here uh, and describe sort of where we are and then where we ought to be and how to get there. And I'd like to do it in the following way. I'd like to describe what I call the hard path for water, which is what I think about as the second age of water, uh, an age of engineering design and infrastructure and centralized systems and, and so on. And I'll go into that in detail. And then the soft path for water. And let me think of, let's think about it in the following way. The hard path built for water supply. We built reservoirs, we built aqueducts to move water from where we had it to where we wanted it. We built uh, groundwater systems to take water out of the ground or to take water out of our rivers. We built centralized treatment systems. We built infrastructure to supply water to us. And that was an enormously important thing that we did. The soft path says let's rethink what we mean by supply. And I'll talk about that in a minute in a little more detail. Um, but uh, part of the challenge with the hard path moving forward is that we're running up against what I call peak water limits. We might want more water out of the Colorado River, but we can't have any more. We literally use it all. It's a renewable resource, but we use it all. We're overtapping groundwater systems around the world. Somebody else mentioned uh, 70 to 80 percent of the water that humans use goes to agriculture in the previous, in the food section. A very significant amount of our agricultural production worldwide 
comes from groundwater aquifers that are unsustainably being used. They're being drawn down faster than they're being recharged, just like oil is being drawn down faster than nature makes more of it. There are non-renewable resources for water as well, like groundwater. And so we might want more groundwater in certain regions, like the Ogallala, which produces a tremendous amount of the US's corn and soybeans, but we can't have any more. That's a peak limit, and that's the supply constraint. The hard path said there's some demand for water out there, and our job is to satisfy that demand. And we are going to assume, and this is what water planners are taught in school, that as populations grow and as our economies grow, the demand for water is going to grow. And that's an assumption. And therefore, we need to build more supply to satisfy that demand. And the soft path for water says something different. It says, let's rethink what we mean by demand. We don't want to use water except for the most basic things we do for drinking, for fundamental cleaning, for, for growing food. We want things. We want food. We want clean clothes. We want uh, to make goods and services. If we can do those things with less water, then we're managing demand. And I'll talk about that a little more. But it, the key part of the soft path for water is rethinking demand. The hard path says water is an economic good. And the soft path says water is a human right and an economic good. And let's figure out how to balance those things. The hard path was a centralized vision. It built centralized treatment systems and distribution systems, and it produced one kind of water, potable water, incredibly high quality water. And we use that water for everything. We use it to flush our toilets. We use it to water our lawns. And the soft path says, let's protect source water quality. Let's match the qualities of water that we have with the qualities of water we need. And maybe we can have distributed systems and broad systems that aren't centralized, that don't produce one kind of thing for multiple purposes, and increase the flexibility of our water system. The hard path didn't think about ecosystems. And it didn't think about e ecosystems because, A, we didn't understand what we were doing to natural ecosystems, or we didn't care. But now we understand, and thinking about the ethical and moral discussions that we've been having over the last few days, now we care, or at least some of us care. And so the soft path for water says, meet human needs for water, but meet ecological needs for water as a key part of what we do, as a central part of what we do. And the hard path said, we have one kind of infrastructure. Let's have one kind of management system. We have water utilities. We have centralized management. And the soft path says, think more broadly about how we manage water. Think about decentralized management systems and, and institutions. Think about communities and integrate community needs into decision making and, and so on. So, in 2010, after a long debate, decades-long debate, the United Nations declared a formal human right to water. Uh, and I won't, I won't go into the history of that. Um, but there is now a human right to water. Uh, and the challenge is how do we, in a modern society, meet all of the demands for water while satisfying the critical responsibilities we have to satisfy the human right to water. What does that mean for water pricing and subsidies and distribution? What does it mean for the millions and hundreds of millions and billions of people who don't have access to safe water and sanitation? But that's a step forward on the moral and ethical side, and it's a step forward on the management side, because corporations are now beginning to think about what's, what are their responsibilities under a legal human right to water. Governments are now on notice that they have to meet basic human needs for water. And this is part of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We can restore ecosystems. This is a picture of a dam called the Elwha Dam on the Elwha River in Washington State. Uh, a fairly big dam. It blocked a salmon run. Uh, it was built for the lumber industry. It produced some hydroelectric power. 
And a few years ago, it was torn down. It was removed because the ecological damage that that dam caused was finally considered to be more value, higher, a higher cost than the benefit that the dam provided. And within a year or two, the river was restoring itself and salmon were spawning many miles upstream already. Ecosystems can restore themselves if we give them a chance. And in the United States, a thousand dams have been removed, mostly very small, mostly damaging, mostly risky, mostly ecologically, uh, uh, ecologically costly and not economically beneficial. But increasingly dams the size of Elwha have been removed. And that's an example of ecological restoration with the understanding that water is an important piece of the ecological challenge we face. I talked about the demand side of things. The idea simply is, can we do the things we want with less water? Can we wash our clothes and flush our toilets and take our showers and have beautiful gardens with less water? And the answer is yes. A tremendous amount of the water that we use is used inefficiently. And part of this is technology. So the national standard in the United States today for toilets is 1.6 gallons per flush. 40 years ago, it was six gallons per flush. So that's a 75 or 80% reduction in the amount of water required to flush toilets. And the truth is toilet, the modern toilet is better designed today than the old toilets. Washing clothes, you buy a front-loading washing machine, you're saving energy, you're saving water, you're saving detergent, and it's doing a better job than the old top-loading washing machines. So we can do the things that we want in an urban setting, and by this I, incl I include industrial and commercial, with less water. And that reduces pressure on our rivers and our streams and groundwater. It produces less wastewater. It's doing what we want with fewer resources. And food is a huge part of this. Again, 80% of the water humans use goes to grow food. Uh, uh, we've heard some about that in the previous session. We can grow more food with less water. Uh, change irrigation technology, uh, employ soil moisture monitors and sensors so that we're only irrigating when the soil is and the crop needs it. Uh, we can change crop types from water intensive crops to less water intensive crops. Uh, in California, for example, we did a study that looked at the potential. California is a fantastic irrigation, a fantastic agricultural economy. Um, uh, we did a study at the Institute that looked at the potential to grow on the same acreage with the same crop distribution, but with better irrigation technology or soil moisture monitors, we can grow the same amount of food with 15% less water. And 15% less water in irrigation in California that, uh, that savings is as much water as the entire urban sector in California uses. So that's a big amount of savings. And if you think about changing crop types, you think about changing irrigated land, uh, there, there's additional savings. And so in the conversation earlier this morning about how do we grow more food for a growing population, part of that is a water question. Where are we going to find the water to grow more food for a population of nine or 10 billion people? Uh, and the answer is we're only going to do it by improving what we call crop per drop, by growing more food with less water. And again, the good news is the potential to do that is enormous. I talked about supply, and I said rethink supply is part of the soft path for water. And by that, I mean don't drill another groundwater well, don't build another dam, don't tap more water out of the Colorado River, but there are other supply options. So we collect in the richer countries of the world a tremendous amount of wastewater because we learned that we didn't want to just dump it in our rivers. We collect it, we treat it often to a very high standard, and then we throw it away. Now, when we do that in St. Louis, they use it downstream. But when we do it in California, it goes into the ocean. It's gone. We treat it and we get rid of it. And increasingly, there's a conversation, and more than a conversation, there's construction of wastewater treatment and reuse systems. 
And when I talked about the quality issue, we can produce any quality of water we want from any quality of wastewater. We can produce potable water from the worst quality sewage or industrial wastes. We, we understand how to do that technologically. But the other point is we don't have to. We can treat wastewater and use it for industrial cooling or for agricultural use uh, up to and including potable use, but it doesn't require that. And more and more cities and states and countries around the world are looking at wastewater as a new source. Israel treats and reuses 85 to 95 percent of its wastewater. The city of Windhoek, Namibia, the capital of Namibia, one of the driest countries on the world, has been using treated wastewater as potable use for 30 years. California at the moment treats and reuses about 15% of its wastewater, but we could treat and reuse 80 or 90% of our wastewater. And that's a new source of supply that doesn't require taking more water out of our ecosystems. And there are other ideas for alternative sources of supply, up to and including desalination. And people love to talk about desalination. The reality is 97% of the water on the planet is salt water. We know how to desalinate water. It's very expensive. It's energy intensive. But when we've done the other things that are cheaper and faster, like conservation and efficiency, like wastewater treatment and reuse, we can desalinate. There's a new desalination plant in California. In the Middle East, uh, in the Arabian Gulf and the Persian Gulf area, they've been using desalination for a long time because they really are water scarce. Uh, Israel, Spain, many other countries are moving to desalination, and that's a potential source of supply as well. We can capture more of our storm water in our cities, and instead of diverting it right away to our rivers and our oceans, we can use it to recharge groundwater. So finally, this isn't just wishful thinking. This is a reality. Uh, this is a graph that shows the gross national product of the United States in green, showing that exponential growth that economists love to see, and I won't comment on the appropriateness of that. And the green line, uh, the blue line, is total water withdrawals in the United States for everything. Everything. Irrigation, washing your clothes, industrial use, power plant cooling, everything. And it shows the assumption was that those two curves would always grow together, that we would always need more and more water as the economy grows and as the population grows. But something happened around 1980. Those two curves split apart, and we use less water today in the United States and much less water per capita than we used in 1980. Demand for water is going down. We're becoming more efficient. We're changing the nature of our industry and our economy. We're growing more food with less water. If those curves had continued to grow, we would have had to more than double the total amount of water we were withdrawing in the United States. And I couldn't tell you where that water could have come from, especially in the Western United States. But they didn't continue to grow. We're moving toward a soft path for water. So let me close by saying the water problem is bad, it's especially bad in other parts of the world. Uh, it'll get worse if we don't do things about it. Climate change is a fundamental challenge that's going to threaten every piece of that puzzle. But there's an alternative path. We can do things differently. We can move toward a more sustainable future for water in every aspect of our society. And everything that we do in improving efficiency and growing more food with less water and using wastewater instead of throwing it away, those things improve our resilience and our ability to deal with the challenges that are imposed by climate change as well. Uh, and so let me leave you with that positive thought. A sustainable future for water is possible. Uh, the Pope's Laudato Si has been mentioned a lot in the context of climate change. But I would note he had a lot to say there about water. Uh, if you look at there, there are whole sections addressing the broad issue of water and human rights and the human right to water and poverty and climate and water connections. Uh, he noted that access to safe drinkable water is a basic and universal human right and should be pursued as quickly and as aggressively as possible. Thank you very much.